When I finished residency at Hopkins, I really didn't know what I was planning on doing with my life. Um, but I knew that there were a ton of my friends who were photographers like myself, um, who didn't really have any sort of connection to the healthcare system. So they would always send me an email or an IM chat with, you know, some photo of some rash or something like that. And they'd be like, what's wrong with me? And, you know, being a nice friend that I was, I um, would reply, you know, with some advice or, you know, you should see the doctor or just hang tight, you'll be fine. Um, but then I just thought that, well, if I could do that for my friends, I think I can do that for my neighborhood. So that's what really gave me the idea. Um, just knowing that, like, we're all sort of communicating differently as a culture now, especially, you know, millennials and Gen Xers. Um, you know, I just figured, why not tailor a practice in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, that mixed internet communication with house, house calls and, you know, PayPal. So I just designed my own website that had a different promise. Um, and that promise was I'm a new kind of doctor. You can communicate with me the way you communicate with your friends. Um, and that to me was just sort of uh, the beginning of everything. And it just had a little button that said, make an appointment. And that would bring up my Google Calendar where you could input your symptoms and your address. And that would send an alert to my iPhone and I would go do a house call and then they'd pay me via PayPal. But it was great because I could charge, you know, anywhere from 100 to $200 a visit, which is less than most office visits in New York and do five or six a day and make a very comfortable living because my overhead was nothing because I worked out of my apartment and uh, didn't have an office or staff. So um, it was really about just simplifying things, simplifying my life. And that led to simplifying, you know, my patients' lives. So to me, healthcare should be simplified uh, down to its, you know, bare essence because 90% of us are sort of light users of healthcare in America. Um, so why can't we just make it simple again? In the very beginning, you create a profile and you search for a doctor in your neighborhood and um, you like a doctor, so you add them to your team. Um, when you add a doctor to your team, um, they can read and write to your medical records. They're all encompassed within hellohealth.com in your profile. And so um, once you add a doctor to your team, you can make an appointment with them. Um, and it's all sort of, you know, sort of like renting a zip car. It's a really nice interface to just sort of, you know, uh, make, a, make an appointment with your doctor. Um, and you meet up with that doctor in his or her office. Um, and the doctors got total freedom to set how much time they spend with you. So they might only need a half an hour or so or an hour. But it's really about just establishing a relationship and maintaining a relationship. Because once you've seen the doctor in person, um, that opens up a whole new world of communication tools. So you can email, you can video chat, you can IM with your doctor. But your doctor has to get paid for communication, so he or she charges an hourly rate for communicating. Um, so if it takes your doctor like 15 minutes to reply to an email, it's a quarter of an hour. Um, it's up to the doctor to have a membership fee if they want. Um, but I don't know if that's the future. Uh, I think it's just pay as you go. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it just changes the way doctors are paid. Doctors right now are paid for office visits and procedures. Um, and that encourages them to do as much as they can. If you pay them an hourly rate um, that, they, that they set, um, you know, it changes how they practice medicine. Um, right now, it's, the evidence says that about 50% of all doctor visits are unnecessary, but they only get paid to bring you into the office, so that's what they do. Um, so if you don't have that incentive, um, that means 50% of problems can be taken care of without physically seeing you, um, but augmented with good communication. So it actually depends 100% on the doctor and the patient. Um, there are some doctors that are very, you know, they just want to see you all the time. And some doctors are sort of, you know, if they know you and know, you know, you're a great, you know, capable person that can take care of themselves, they might tend to do more over the internet than in their office. So it's really a difficult question to ask, to answer, because um, we don't know. It's very patient and doctor dependent. I think that, um, 
It depends on the situation, absolutely. But um, yes, if you can see a, per a person's you know, life and see where they live and how they interact and see what's in their refrigerator, see if there's Twinkies on the you know, counter, um, you can say, well, hey, you know, I don't know if you're you know, really living the best sort of lifestyle for you. Um, however, at the same time, it doesn't really... Most people know that they aren't living the best lifestyle if they aren't living the best lifestyle. Um, doctors aren't really trained to, you know, encourage you to change your behavior. We're sort of changed, encouraged, we're, we're, we're trained from day one to write prescriptions and do procedures. Uh, we're absolutely horrible at getting you to change your lifestyle. So I actually think that doctors shouldn't be um, involved in lifestyle changes because that's not what we've done. Uh, for the past hundred years, our training is fully focused on um, making a profit off sickness, uh, which is wrong. So um, I think a whole new profession needs to come in and start making a profit off wellness and keeping you out of the sickness industry. The best way to do that is um, through uh, most likely just, you know, careful listening um, and careful understanding of uh, the client to understand whether or not they can change certain aspects of their lifestyle. Um, house calls is probably a good uh, situation for that profession, but for doctors, I mean, their time is just, you know, too expensive to be traveling all over, you know, uh, a city. Uh, it's probably not the best use of resources. Whenever you, um, whenever you give patients a number and there's like a real person on the end, that's their doctor, um, they're not going to call you at 2 o'clock in the morning unless there's really something wrong. Um, if they get a 1-800 number to some faceless person, they'll call it 2 o'clock in the morning because they just don't care. Um, but yeah, so the deal is I think that um, increasing accessibility in a doctor-patient relationship actually uh, minimizes uh, uh, poor communication. Um, because I think there's a certain respect that people have for one another. Now, that's not saying that, like, you know, there are a few patients, as in every doctor has a few patients in every practice that are just sort of, you know, over the top in terms of communication. Uh, and yeah, that's where it gets sort of um, difficult. But at the same time, uh, there's ways to handle that. I think the main shortcoming is that patients aren't the customers of healthcare. Um, customers are people who purchase or buy, you know, buy goods or services. Um, and as patients, we've sort of turned that duty over to insurance companies to sign contracts with large groups of hospitals or doctors. And all of a sudden, you've sort of relinquished control of customer status. And when you do that, you're not really treated like a customer. You're not really treated like the Apple store treats you whenever they're trying to take care of, you know, your computer when it breaks. Um, and that's sort of what healthcare uh, has become, a sort of faceless institution um, that really isn't focused on the patient's needs nor satisfaction. I mean, there's countries like Norway. Um, the deal is... Norway has 4.8 million people, and Kaiser in California covers about 10 million people. Um, so you can't really say, are any countries doing it correctly, because it's like apples and oranges. Um, are there systems in the United States that are doing it properly? Absolutely. Kaiser, Geisinger, Intermountain, um, Bassett in uh, upstate New York. Absolutely. Those, those, those guys are just really, really nailing um, the proper delivery and payment for healthcare. I think it's a bad policy given the uh, current situation of paying for sickness because the sicker a population gets, the more expensive it's going to get. The older a population gets, the more expensive it's going to get. So, in the widget that we sort of live and die by in healthcare is sickness. Um, it's only going to, it's designed to skyrocket out of control. So the business model of healthcare delivery has to change before we institute everybody, you know, mandating everybody pay into a system that's designed to just, you know, not do what's best for you. It's designed to do what, 
what maximizes their profitability. Theoretically, a shift to electronic medical records would help significantly. However, electronic medical records don't solve the problems that, that doctors face. Uh, they're designed for insurance billing as well as, um, as, well as protecting them legally uh, from lawsuits. So they're designed to produce as much information about an interaction as possible. And data is often um, uh, irrelevant to actual clinical care. To the case at hand, because you know the last the last visit might have been a one minute visit, but it's you know five pages worth of notes that are just you know designed to protect your butt. So um, you know the interfaces are often like you know Windows ninety five. These things were built you know fifteen years ago. These legacy systems, they're built in like you know the Windows ninety five era. Um, they're siloed pieces of you know uh, bad technology. Um, so I do not support uh, current electronic medical records um, being mandated uh, across the United States because I think that the electronic medical record industry needs to be disrupted with today's technology. Well, you know, um, Obama has appropriated about $20 billion to get doctors to use electronic medical records. Um, how much would it cost Facebook if it were designed to power medicine to sign up all 11 million healthcare workers in America? It surely wouldn't cost $20 billion. It would actually cost you know, significantly less because the building technology today that you know, is, is flexible enough and, and platform-like, like Facebook, for healthcare would absolutely be the proper way to go. But the deal is, you know, as in everything, the money and the corporate interests control the welfare of our country. So it's a real problem. I think a system like Hello Health could definitely encourage more people to go into primary care, absolutely. However, you know, for the past at least 10 years, about 5% of doctors have been going into primary care. Um, most high-performing healthcare systems in the world um, have about 75% primary care doctors and 25% specialists. In America, um, we're about exactly opposite. Uh, we have 75% specialists. And we're about two generations of doctors behind the curve on this one. So um, it, once boomers retire or die, uh, primary care is sort of dead with them, um, which is unfortunate because that's what, you know, that's what sort of controls your experience and your health. Um, that's the person that you should be able to depend on. Um, but right now, I mean, specialists are making double, triple, quadruple, uh, as much as, as primary care doctors. So, you know, and seeing like half as many patients. So what's the incentive for doctors to go into primary care? Um, there's not much. Uh, Hello Health, a system like Hello Health uh, that encourages and pays primary care doctors for communication and pays them more on par with, with um, specialists would absolutely, I think, work. Uh, then there are other issues where, you know, the medical sort of institutions devalue the uh, art and talent of primary care in exchange for, you know, the big bad neurosurgeon, um, the respect they get. Um, I don't know, that's going to be really interesting. I mean, that's the kind of stuff I'm sort of thinking about right now. Um, what I think is most interesting about the death of primary care and the constant and the and this then the rise of the internet as well um, when you think about it um, the internet connecting me with information and connecting me with patients is actually doing something really really interesting to uh, the practice of medicine um, you spend about one hour a year with doctors and about 8765 without doctors so what does that mean to your life? Well, doctors aren't the cure-all for your health. I mean, you are, right? So, I mean, you're sort of like the CEO of your own body and your doctor is a sort of a consultant you call in every once in a while, right? So that basically means um, there are a ton of tools that are just now springing up uh, that connect us with good information that's relevant to you, as well as connect us with other patients who are having similar problems as you. So. Um, I hope that the internet can prevent uh, office visits, especially primary care visits, 
uh, and help people take care of themselves better. There's tools now. Um, you know, you can connect with doctors via video chat. Um, I think those tools have serious issues, though, because nobody really uses video chat with strangers. And, and who are the doctors that are on video chat? Why aren't they seeing patients in their office, you know? Um, but I think that there are opportunities uh, to build sort of systems like this. The issue is how do you, when people need a prescription maybe, um, for say antibiotics, uh, that can't really be done over the internet uh, with today's sort of, you know, laws and regulations. The methods of developing drugs is sort of set up so that, you know, you, you try to control for a similar group of people and you give them a similar pill, you know, but the deal is um, we don't know anything about their genetics, you know, so maybe they have these certain enzymes in their body that like really, you know, turn this drug over and turn it into the active metabolite, for example, that helps you. Or maybe you're a bad metabolizer and it, you know, builds up in your liver and causes problems. Um, the deal is the uh, pharmaceutical companies would rather have, um, have their market not limited by 66%. They would just like to sort of, you know, create a drug for everybody, throw it out to the mass, the masses. And um, if it improves symptoms by 5%, well, it's a drug and it's done its job. Um, but in actuality, whenever you look at it across the population, there's a significant amount of people that are harmed by that drug. Um, the FDA tries to, you know, eliminate that as much as possible. Um, but, you know, it doesn't always work. I think that there are certain drugs that, are, uh, that we should not be taking, absolutely. Uh, in 2009, the FDA approved only 26 drugs. 70% uh, of those were Me Too drugs, drugs that were going off patent and uh, needed to be remarketed as, you know, the next purple pill. Uh, for example, it's in order to create, you know, a $400 a month, you know, blockbuster drug uh, in exchange for a $4 a month generic. Um, I think that that is a very, very, very shady practice and it's harming our health uh, in exchange for um, creating a whole industry of profitability off, you know, selling snake oil and marketing gimmicks.